Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayech. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. Figure out what is it that allows you to focus on the person in front of you and their words just to listen, not to judge, not to respond, not, nothing. Who is Anu Smali? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's the toughest question of all. Uh, who is Anu Smali? Uh, wow, first question stopping me. <laughs> Maybe what's been your journey? I mean, like, how did yeah. you and like... Yeah, let me, let me do that first. Uh, yeah. That may help identify who is Anu Smali. So I think my journey has been, I started off as developer and I went kicking and screaming into being a developer. I did <laughs> not want to be in programming, but uh, I got a job, accidentally got a job as a programmer. I needed the job to pay bills. And 15 years later, I'm still in development. Uh, I ended up with, I was leading an IT organization at a financial software company and so I was the head of IT there and it was just not what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I got completely, I decided I'm gonna change my career. I went to an organization, a different organization. And my only ask to the recruiter was, the job must not be an IT focused job. That's it. I do not want to be in IT. Anything Why? IT. Like what are the, what are, what, what are the, the what happens? So, you, you know, as a developer, yeah. <laughs> I'm not wanting to be in IT. And so I never wanted to be a developer to begin with, right? I wanted to I wanted to be more working with people and products, and that's been my passion. I like helping you figure out what is it that you need, not build it. Somebody mm -hmm. else can do the building. I want to help figure out what is it that you need. How do you use it? Why do you use it? That's the curiosity in me. And as a developer, Yes, it was initially, it was really powerful building stuff. But then after a while, it was like, I don't want to build stuff for people. I want to talk to the people who are using the stuff that I'm building. I want to be there. But I didn't know that there was such a thing called product ownership at that point. I was an IT person, right? I went from developer to project manager to IT, I was a I was director of IT and I headed up the IT organization, but it was just something missing for me and it wasn't, I knew I needed to get out and do and experience something different. Mm -hmm. So I quit my job and took a massive pay cut because I was head of IT and now I, I went into this small organization that were that had a consulting arm and they said, well, you know, your entire experience has been IT. So we won't put you in IT, but we'll put you in this place where you have to interact with IT. You will, you understand them, you understand the language, it might be a good place. I'm like, fine, I can never get away from IT. So I got in there and I was director of uh, training and consulting services. So I helped with, we built software and we had consultants who did the who went and worked with clients and my job was to make sure they had good training and they had all the products so i was director of technology for the consulting arm and okay i didn't have to build stuff i had you know i was talking to people and saying so what do you need this product to do okay let me go talk to the people i got into scrum because my boss came to me one day and said so i had a very interesting conversation with the it folks today I didn't understand a word they said, <laughs> not a single word. And they rattled off some things at me and they said, so we would like you to uh, provide us a person who will represent you to be part of this new thing we're doing. <laughs> because I figured you had the best shot of understanding them since you were from IT. So you volunteered. I'm like, what did you volunteer me for? He goes, I don't know, some rugby thing they're doing. I don't understand. I'm like, I don't play rugby. He goes, I don't know. They said something about rugby and scrum and I don't know, you go figure it out. That's how I got into scrum. 
right? <laughs> Purely yeah. accidental. And so he won't told you to be a product owner, I'm assuming. <laughs> he thought he was telling me to be a product owner, but that is that was a lesson for me how not to implement Scrum because I was Scrum master <laughs> for my team and product owner All for my our... team. It was weird. Yeah. So I was for the consulting group. I was a Scrum master, but I represented the consulting group in IT as a product owner. <laughs> At that time, I, I thought it was great. And I struggled with that job, with that role that he put me into. And I was like, there's something not right here. I, I, am, I, I felt I was failing in everything. And I, you know me, I, I'm a, I push myself hard. I'm a perfectionist for myself. I'm like, how can I fail? This is not okay. okay. Uh, I cannot be not good at what I'm doing. And I was feeling like I was failing everybody. And that's when I actually met a agile coach who was who they brought in and the agile coach said, what are you doing? Good Lord, no wonder you're miserable. You can't do both those roles. I'm like, this is what they've told me. He is the one who actually said, here, read this. I didn't know scrum guide books, mm -hmm. nothing. I was just heads down doing what I was told. Um, he's the one who actually said, here, read this book, go watch this video and stuff. And I got into it. I'm like, wait a minute, we're doing this all wrong. This is all messed up. <laughs> and the reason I became a certified Scrum trainer and a coach is to help people like me so that they don't mm. go through the pain I went through. I nearly quit my job and said, Forget about this agile thing. I'm going to go back to my you know, traditional approach because I didn't understand what the right way to do it or that we needed a mindset shift. It was just doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me, the passion about who I am today is about helping the people like me who heard all these things about, oh, agile means, you know, you can just do magic in two weeks and get a whole project done. You don't need to do documentation or planning or nothing. You just put people together and do a daily stand up and put in Jira, by the way, and voila, your project will be done. I want to work. My passion is to help those people understand what, what I understood after those conversations with the coach. Go, oh my God, if you do this right, mm -hmm. it is so different. Um, so back then I helped that organization make a few changes, but they were stuck and mm -hmm. they, they, so I shifted. I went to another company where there was an agile shop. I got into product ownership there and that was the best thing ever. I realized when I became a product owner that I was born to be working in the product side. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I was not a fan of being a scrum master. I didn't like that role too much. I loved okay. being a product owner. And I is, is it like the connection to the customer? Is it the innovation? Is it like what 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 uh uh you know I draws you back, in from a product ownership, yeah. I go back to like I still remember the first time I actually saw this is way back when before Agile days, right? I mm. I was in a financial software company, we used to build software for credit unions. And I bank, I, I, I bank with a credit union. So mm -hmm. I still remember the moment I had taken my two daughters to the credit union for some stuff. And we were talking and the teller said, Oh, we use, and she saw where I worked and she said, Oh, we use your software. And we were doing something with loans. And I said, mm -hmm. do you use this product? She goes, yeah, yeah, I'm using it right now. <laughs> and and my and both my girls went, their eyes went this big saying, you built that? I'm, and I told, the, I told the teller, I said, can you go to this screen and turn the screen? I said, that screen, I built it. <laughs> and, she, and both my girls went, <sighs> and the teller went, Oh my God, let me tell you how amazing this product is, blah, 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 that, mm -hmm. that thing of not just building it personally, but like my team built the product, but it was actually seeing it being used by somebody 
and seeing the impact it has on them. Mm -hmm. For me, the product ownership is around that, the connection to the customers to understand what is it that you truly want and building that and then watching the benefits, watching the impact it has on them. Mm -hmm. For me, that is go satisfying yeah it's so uh, it's it's that yeah it's like it's tighter connection to so maybe to uh uh to, to like tie the like you recently became a cc and like you've been <laughs> big on coaching and uh how do you um you, you know uh, uh look the, uh, at the connection between coaching and product ownership like you know a lot of times people associate it with scrum master mm -hmm. uh, but coaching is coaching right it is. And I think so. if you look at our community, our, our guides community, the trainers and coaches, there are very few of us who've come up the product ownership path. Mm -hmm. lot, I think majority is have been scrum masters. And that's amazing because they can work with the team. They can work with the product owners. But to actually have been a product owner and then to step into being a trainer or coach, I have I, I can actually tell uh, clients, here's an example of how I've done this, mm -hmm. rather than here's an example of how I've coached it. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a difference there. And I would love and this is my goal. Every time I do a CSPPO class, I tell every student in there, how can I help you become a certified team coach, we need mm -hmm. more product owners in the guides community. Mm -hmm. Because we talk a lot about Scrum Masters and, you know, everything is about Scrum Masters. And I want people to be more focused on product ownership as well, because product owners control the garbage in, garbage out. You can have the best Scrum Master and the most amazing team. If you don't have an effective PO, you're not going to get far. And everybody else will have to pick up the slack there. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, and, you know, something that you just said kind of uh, triggered another to our question, which is around, we need, you know, I think in general, we need more diversity and we need more. Uh, so maybe uh, the, I, I I listened to one of your uh, uh, presentations on uh, gender parity. Yes. And like when you showed those numbers, as far as how many years it's going to take uh, uh, to get to, uh, so, so could we explore that a little bit? Like, let's yeah. first de define what is gender parity. Could you first? So, yeah. So, there's a big misconception with um, parity. Parity is if you and I have the same job, are we going to be paid the same amount? Mm -hmm. No difference because I'm a woman, I get paid less. And and no difference because oh you're a woman so you cannot coach this group i was actually told by an organization that the senior leaders in that organization would be uncomfortable with me coaching them because i'm a woman mm -hmm. that's where you say there is no gender parity here right people talk about equality uh, there is a big difference between equality and equity mm -hmm. e equity is what we are going for equity is talking about we are going to remove the systemic things that stop diversity from showing up. Right? There is an image that I, I show in when I'm talking about gender parity or diversity in general. It's about, you know, if there are three people who are trying to look over a fence and they have they are of different heights. If you if we say, well, we need to make everyone equal, so we are going to give everybody a box to stand on. The shortest person still maybe may not be able to look over the fence that's not that doesn't work you may say well how about we give the shorter person a larger thing up nobody who is not of the mainstream is looking for a handout i'm not looking for a handout because i'm a woman i can stand my own i can stand my own feet i got it i don't need any favors i need equal opportunity so what do you do to remove that barrier of the fence make the fence see through so it doesn't matter how high you are you can still see across the fence <laughs> exactly that's that systemic barrier that we need to remove and i you think know, that's a really good example of systemic change when we talk yes. about it. it's not just it's like rethinking 
rethinking the whole picture and saying, what can we do here? Not just sticking with the current paradigm and exactly. saying what we can do. Yeah. And it's not about, let me give you, let me give you an extra hand. No, you yeah. ask anybody, like I know there've been, a, there's been a lot of talk uh, this past year around racial uh, equity and stuff. And I, I can tell you, like I've talked to people and said, I don't need charity. Yes, I'm a woman of color, but I don't, I'm not looking for any favors. And I, I've had people ask me, so how do we help this? Give me your time, give time, mentor people, find mm -hmm. people who do not get the opportunity to be part of this mainstream events and go mentor them, right? Uh, I have a circle of I, I mentor a group of CST candidates. Mm -hmm. It's not all women. It's not all people of color. I have two white men in there as well, because this problem cannot be solved just by women. We need to come together to solve this problem collectively. And mm -hmm. this group of candidates that I'm mentoring, I have one ask for that. I give them my time freely. I give them a lot of opportunities. I have one ask when they become a CST, they're going to go mentor some other people and people who don't look like them, who don't live where they live, bring in, bringing in diversity. Same thing for the CTCs and CECs. I am uh, mentoring more, more of them to come in. And I tell every class, I'm happy to mentor anybody, time permitting, right? But if you're a woman, a uh, woman of color, uh, at least I'll have a conversation with you. Because if you look at the guide, just the guides community, right? 30%, uh, I mean, overall, the guides community, 10% are women. And we're talking about Scrum Alliance guides community, but yes. I don't think it's so, any different. I don't think it's that uh, much different anywhere else. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. And the people of color is 3%. Which That's is crazy. Shame. I mean, like, it's, just, a, it's shame. a shame, but it's also like, how can, um, how can we, like, it, it's so right there in front of us. And exactly. yeah, you know, um, but what's also concerning what you said in that uh, presentation is like, uh, uh, I don't know exactly what research you had at the bottom, mm -hmm. but like, it's going to take 54 years for Western Europe. Um, and 170 to, to years for North America. Yeah. And like, yeah, I was looking at the Eastern Europe and Central Asia, Eastern Europe is where I'm from, but that's, yeah. it's, it's uh, close to 110 years. And I'm like, holy crap. Like, you know, yeah. in a, in a sense, I could see that, see that I, I didn't, you know, uh, necessarily think of North America right away as that, but it's like, what can we do? That's way, way too long. I mean, like in a it sense, is. if there's even, even if we cut all of this in half, um, yeah. it's still a lot. It's still a lot, you know, and, and this is where, so people often ask, so how can we help? I think um, the biggest thing is to uh, do a lot of mentoring. Mm -hmm. There are like, when, so traditionally, when you look at trainers and coaches, right? And you, you've been, you travel for work as well. So I've, I recently told somebody that in 2019, when we were still in person, I spent 285 nights in hotels. And people went, what? <laughs> my kids are grown up. My husband could work from home. And I've had so much support from my husband to say, go follow your dream. You want to do this? Go, go do it. I got the home. Mm -hmm. You need that kind of support. And most women, because of the children, they go, I can't leave them home. Who's going to deal with this? Because we still have those stereotypical roles of man and woman or, mm -hmm. you know, the gender roles. And we have got to start those conversations where we said, no, you don't need to have, there is no such thing as the woman has to stay home. The man has to be the one who earns the money. Yes. Biologically, women will have children and stuff. Um, I wish men could have children. That would be, that would be, you know, that would eat people, a lot of things. <laughs> um, but I think fundamental uh, gender roles have to be looked at again. 
because I've had so many women tell me, I cannot do what you are doing. Mm -hmm. I can't travel like that. Uh, how can I do what you're doing without traveling? And I think this also goes to, I know there are a bunch of trainers who just stay in their city and work just there. And these are the trainers who've been around for a long time and they're established. For the newer trainers who are coming in, it's very hard for them to do that. Name a city where there isn't a trainer. Mm -hmm. Bigger city, I, yeah. <laughs> at least in the United States, yeah. At least in the United States, at least in the big cities, yeah. If you find a little hole in the wall city, maybe you won't find a trainer who's established there. Mm -hmm. So it's hard, so that means you have to travel. And if you're a coach, uh, before this virtual thing, you know, you had to travel on site. Mm -hmm. And I still remember this. I moved to California just because of that. Hey, if you want to right? go. Gotta... <laughs> but, you know, you were able to move your family with you. But imagine if your wife had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. What would the decision be then? Would it be the well, same? Even decision? today. And like, you know, you bring up another point. It's it's so true. And, you know, I joke around when I said, you know, like, I wouldn't, uh, you know, when you said, you wish I, uh, man could give birth. And I think. You know what uh, what that brought up to me is just like empathy we talk about empathy but like most people like uh, how often do you put yourself in somebody else's shoes or body to think about exactly. like what are they really thinking doing uh yeah. feeling like the whole ex you know uh, uh exactly. taking all of yeah. their senses yeah. you know yeah, yeah. you know and, I, uh, when you talk about empathy right um i, I remember this one instance i had a manager this is years ago a uh, male manager, nice guy. Now, yeah. uh, he, we had to go travel to a client site and he had said, I would love for you to come with me, you know, because you know the client, he was, he is new into the role. And he said, you know, I'd love for you to come so that there's continuity, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. Happy to travel. Um, and this, we were, we were in Pennsylvania and we had to travel to Toronto. And I said, okay, but you need to give me let me know as soon as the decision is made. And he goes, yeah, I think we'll we'll fly out maybe next Wednesday. And this was the Wednesday the previous week. I'm like, okay, I can do that. Uh, and then he said, actually, Wednesday won't work. We'll probably fly out Thursday morning and fly back Friday night. I'm like, yeah, that works. But it was not confirmed. On Monday, I'm telling him, I'm like, dude, is this confirmed? He goes, yeah, well, well, you know, we, we'll confirm it today or tomorrow. And I had to tell him, I said, listen to me. You can walk out of your house and your wife will take care of everything. I'm the wife. I'm the mother. I got to take care of is that are there lunches? Is there food? Because that means breakfast, lunch and dinner for two days has to be taken care of. My husband works. My kids go to school. I need to prep stuff. You can't tell me Wednesday evening we are flying out tomorrow. I cannot do that. And he looked at me and he went, oh. I never considered that. Exactly. You had, you never considered, you, there was no empathy there about your situation is going to be different. It was just, well, I can just pack my bag and say, honey, I'll be back tomorrow. And it's fine. But it doesn't work that way for everyone. No, and there's also like another thing maybe to uh, throw into this. So we, we've talked about gender parity, uh, empathy, but the other thing is this unconscious bias. Like sometimes we're doing it intentionally, sometimes it's just uh, mm -hmm. uh, unconscious. And um, what do you think, like, you know, especially when it comes to leadership, like what is the connection between leadership and that unconscious bias? You know, I, uh, in my leadership classes, I, I tell them a story about me. I never used to do that before until I said, you know, unconsciously I'm not being vulnerable. So I need to tell them my own journey, right? And um, that we all have unconscious biases because we have a brain. Mm -hmm. If you have a brain, you have a bias. Some biases are conscious. Like I know I don't like certain things and I'm going to react in that way. But the unconscious biases are the scariest one because every human being has them right and mm -hmm. i still remember one of my uh, i said this to somebody and uh, they said you have a very you have a big unconscious bias towards the younger generation i'm like no i don't <laughs> and they're like yes you do and they pointed out something i'd said and i'm going 
Oh. Because as, a, as people in my generation, we have an unconscious bias towards this new generation. I have it. I acknowledge it. Can I do something about it? Most of the time. You know, we, you do it, I do it with my girls. And I'm like, here you go on with your TikTok. That's my unconscious bias against what they are using. I have my own things that I use, right? Um, and I think as a leader, it's important to listen to what people are saying because nobody will come and say, Milan, you have an unconscious bias. You know, that's not how it shows up. People will say things like, you know, that I felt very uncomfortable when you said that. When you hear words like that, you have to pause and go, okay, I made somebody uncomfortable. What did I say? Did mm -hmm. I mean to do me? Did I mean to do that? And it all goes back to intention versus impact. Yeah. And so also like another thing that uh, you just remind me of, it's also about awareness, right? How aware 100%. am I as a leader, right? Uh, 100%. And, yeah. Right. When you talk about emotional intelligence and leadership, the foundation is awareness. Mm -hmm. If I've worked with some leaders who, you know, they have no self-awareness at all. And right. you're like, okay, first we're going to start there. I cannot help you be a better leader until you are aware of the fact that you need to be a better leader. Mm -hmm. If you think you're the most awesome leader in the world, there is nothing I can do to help you anyway. Well, that's the thing. And it comes like to all of this, like, you know, everything that we've said so far, it comes down to that awareness. And uh, yeah. um, I know that you use, uh, I use the Johari window in, in your too. classes. And uh, like, it's it's interesting, even just using Johari window to help people understand their blind spots. And exactly. uh, it's so simple, yet a lot of times people go like, oh, wow, you know, <laughs> like I didn't, this is a, just a, a, you know, a wake up call. I just never exactly. considered it. Yeah. You know, and I've actually used, I use the Johari window in my one-on-one -on -one coaching as well with leaders to help them understand that, yes, your blind spots are important, but it's the unknown unknown that mm -hmm. you kind of need to look at because those, a lot of your unconscious biases stay there. Exactly. And right. that, 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 that unknown, unknown is all about uh, experience and trying to figure out, like, you exactly. know, what is it really that I don't know, right? And, and you know, I have, um, I have, over the last four to five years, I've done a lot of work on self. Mm -hmm. I've done leadership programs and coaching programs just to learn more about me and the impact I have so that I can re reduce, I'm never going to be able to remove all of them, reduce, <laughs> be more my blind aware, spot, yeah. reduce my blind spots and unconscious biases, right? Um, and the other thing with the unconscious bias, and I've started doing this more and more, is when I hear unconscious bias coming towards me, I point it out. Mm -hmm. Like I get this all the time. Your English is really good for an Indian. I'm like, <laughs> I know my English is probably better than yours because I've been speaking English my entire life and I speak the Queen's English. It's probably, you know, and telling people that what you just said, that's bias towards Indians and the way we speak. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, I didn't mean any offense. Again, intention versus impact. Right. It's also it's, culture like shapes that too. Sometimes you you, you yeah. grew up in that type of culture that where it's acceptable. So like you don't even think about it. You just like kind of not autopilot. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And the number of times like you know I know um, like I've lived in the United States for way longer than I've ever lived in India. I've I've been an adult in the U.S. I've never lived as an adult in India, and I still get a lot of comments like you are unlike other Indians. <laughs> I don't know how to take that. Is that a uh, compliment? Is that a, is that, should I take offense to that? Because India is my birth country. United States is my adopted country. I belong to both. Yeah. Right? So now what? Uh, and you understand that, right? It's oh, this, yeah. Same. Yeah, same that part of me of yeah. who am I? So when you started this conversation and you said, who is Anu? For me, my, immediately my mind went, I don't know. <laughs> because 
who am I? I don't know because am I Indian? Am I American? Am I a coach? Am I a trainer? Yeah. What am I? I don't know. I think who is a new is an answer I hope to have before I die. Uh -huh. It's a but journey you know, towards figuring it out. Yeah. But, you know, in a sense, like, you know, when you, if I, if somebody asked me who Anu is, you know, like, it's some of the things that, you know, uh, 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 for listeners, we know each other. So it, yes. it's not, this is not my first time, like some of the speakers or guests. Uh, um, and I think, you know, a lot of who Anu is came through this conversation in the sense that, uh, you know, you care. I remember when uh, I reached out to you when I needed help, when I needed you know somebody to co-train with, uh, uh, when others didn't even respond, you were one of the people. And the way that you just embraced and helped me out um, is something that I'll never forget. You know, I, I think uh, some of the stuff that you're doing in the community that you've been doing in the community uh, is reflection of who Anu is. And you know, uh, when I look at Anu, I uh, look at Anu as a, a really good human being. <laughs> I don't look at Anu as, you know, is Anu, it, it, it doesn't even cross my mind mm. as far as those things that you discussed. And maybe, again, that's just, you know, through that experience or whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, I also can empathize with people that would think, you know, mm. otherwise, but um, it that's is that. the best compliment you could ever give me. You are a good human. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I think that's all, you know, in a, yes. at the end of the day, that uh, at least I hope that's all what we can mm -hmm. wish for, right? Yeah. Um, but maybe to come back to uh, leadership and, you know, diversity, like, you know, what can leaders do to encourage diversity in the workplace and also address the unconscious bias? So diversity, one of the first things I would say is if you are a senior leader in an organization, um we often talk about the glass ceiling that women and other uh different diversity uh, people who are who belong to different diversity groups they can't break the glass ceiling but here's the thing is nobody if nobody's on the ladder how are you going to break the ceiling if you're a senior leader in an organization that first rung of management bring more diverse a group of people into management at that first little rung of the ladder. This, the thing we need to fix is the broken rung because studies have shown, so what the study I did was the McKinsey Report, the World Economic Forum, all of them have said the same thing. The first level of management that most organizations have, they're not, that's not very diverse. There's, the diversity is two out of 10 candidates are not white male. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, if there are only two out of 10 at the bottom most level, by the time we get to the top, there's going to be zero because people <laughs> fall off, right? Yeah. So yeah. you got to get more diversity at the line manager level if you want to build diversity in leadership of your organization. And here's the thing, this is not about women need to be there because we are women. Diversity of thought, diversity of styles is important for the existence of a company. Exactly. You I was going to say, like, there is so much also, as much as, you know, we've done research, there's probably more research on innovation and how, what, uh, uh, right. you know, part of diversity plays into it. So it's almost, if you don't see it morally, that it's correct, at least look right. at it from a business standpoint. That, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And that's well said. If you don't see it from a moral, ethical point of view, Look at it from a business point of view. You are going to get diverse perspectives and thoughts about it, how to solve a problem. And you may actually get to a point where you're going to solve a problem that will, that will ultimately benefit your organization. Mm -hmm. And isn't that what you truly want, right? Exactly. So fix the broken rung. Look at the, the people you're mentoring into management. Look at that group. How diverse are they? How what is the diversity in that group? It and again, it doesn't have to be. It's going to be all diversity people from different diverse cultures. Create a healthy mix. It's not about okay now. Don't promote any white men. Just be diverse women and have people of color. You need both. Yeah, balance. The problems like of the world that. cannot be solved by one group. Mm -hmm. So for me, don't swing the it, pendulum too much. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so it yeah. goes to the opposite direction, right? Um, 
If you do that, you are going to learn about all these people, which will in turn help you uncover your blind spots and show you what your unconscious biases are. Because we don't interact with people that much, people don't say, well, that was not right to say. So your unconscious biases and blind spots are never uncovered because you don't deal with the people with whom you have the unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. So open up your groups, make your first line, um, line manager group more diverse and see what happens in your organization. Wait yeah. for the magic. And take action. Like I keep, like I've been bringing this up because it was unconscious bias that I had. So like when I first started this podcast, the, uh, uh, I don't know now three four months ago um you know it was most like who who would I have a drink with you know at the bar and just talk and you know what came to mind is mostly guys and mostly white uh -huh. guys right yeah. uh, and then as I started doing more and more I'm like well look at you know <laughs> look at my lit look at the people that I'm talking to They're like and then it came to like well you know one thing is to acknowledge it but the other yeah. thing is to actually do something about it Exactly. Right? And, and I, you know, and uh, um, it's just, it was like, sometimes like we need uh, uh, another push or just make it more actionable. Talking about it is, uh, is not enough, I guess. You exactly. Know? And this is what, you know, I've been telling people, it's the micro do's. Mm -hmm. Like small, you don't have to say, Oh, I am going to do this. You don't have to do that. Do, do one little thing. What's a micro do that you can actually take action on that will make a difference? It doesn't have to change the world. It has to change the world for one person. Mm -hmm. What can you do? Find a small thing. Can you mentor somebody? Can you talk to somebody? Can you help somebody? Can you guide somebody into a role, a position, a class, whatever it is. Right? Mm -hmm. Micro do's is what we want to focus on because it's the small things. It's like a snowball effect. Mm -hmm. If 100 of us do one small little thing, that snowball is going to be big yeah, rather than just yeah. me doing 100 things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's that's so true. And I think we just have to kind of uh, nudge each other and and make sure that, you know, at least we understand that again goes back to that um, uh, uh, experience so going back to Johari, that unknown, unknown. Yeah. The only way that you can start realizing um, is by uh, going to unknown, unknown. And I think, you know, something that you can probably relate to, like coming to United States, I was old enough to remember that unknown, unknown. And it was scary to think about it before we came here. But like, as I started immersing myself in a new culture, in a new environment, I started realizing things, for instance, like, uh, hey, I hate people of different religion. Uh, why do I do that? Like yeah. here in the United States, it's, it's you know, um, it, it's a uh, lot less, lot less common. So like yeah. it, it started breaking my mental models and things that I had. And well, that was mostly due to the experiences. <laughs> it's yeah. not like something that came out. It's like, you know, exactly. uh, by actually being exposed. Uh, right. That, so. You know, and something you say, like, I, I have, I do not have very clear memories of when I moved. Um, I was, I was an adult. I was 21. Uh, but I had my experiences in India were as a teenager, as a child, I just turned 21 or 22, I think, when I came here. So I I was so excited about coming here. And I don't think I had formed all my biases in India yet. Because uh. <laughs> I was still a child and I had the biases that are passed down in family. But I don't think I had formed enough of my own biases. And I think that happened once I came here. And now when I think back, when I go back to visit India, those biases show up very differently because I now react in India like somebody from here would do exactly. because my biases were formed here, not <laughs> back there. And it's yeah. weird. It's so weird. And uh, my, so when I travel, when I travel to India with my husband, uh, he's American our reactions were so different <laughs> and uh he was more 
relaxed about stuff and i'm going oh my god that's not <laughs> just, he, he he reacted to things just so differently and it was just so interesting to see and it that's what actually made me go why am i behaving so neurotically yeah. well i he think I, I find myself i find myself in a similar situation and in that instance i feel like uh, uh i'm less empathizing with people than somebody else that's yes. not exposed it's almost like you're judging them in a way or uh, right. just because you're familiar and you're from there rather than you know somebody that's not it's just you know accept them for what they are right. like you know your aunt's doing weird stuff that typically your, your aunt's don't do here like shoving you know stuff on your you know your guest plate like eat more and uh... <laughs> exactly and and that's like i'm going why are you reacting to that and my husband's going this is weird i'm like really the things you find weird i don't find weird and he goes uh, the things you find weird i don't find weird and it's uh, it's just interesting to be able to see from their point of view like i took our um our oldest daughter when she just turned 20 i think um she we took her to india for the first time it was fascinating to see the country through her through her eyes <laughs> so she was still at that age where she, her biases have not formed mm -hmm. not the, her own she's family biases yes and it was so fascinating to see the country of my birth through her eyes uh, for the first yeah. time and i'm going wow is that what you see when you see that <laughs> how yeah. interesting i see something so different mm -hmm. and i react differently and for me that was a lot of the that was the beginning of the work I've started to do on myself saying, okay, that means I, I gotta, st I still have work to do on me. Mm -hmm. And it, that's why I said, you know, I think it's a constant journey to figure out who, how I'm going to get to be who I want to be. Mm -hmm. And like <clears throat> something that uh, I recently uh, spoke with Mike Spade and uh, I, I read his book, Agile Transformation, which like something that resonated with me, where, which he says, like, you know, as far as the mindset and how we shape our consciousness, is like the stories that we tell ourselves. Yeah. And it's like, you know, if I'm stuck on a story that I'm telling myself, it's not till I change that story to see it. Different. And those are those biases. Those are those, you know, things. So like understanding the story that we're telling ourselves. Because uh, everybody's telling a different story, even though it's yeah. uh, <clears throat> is very interesting. It is interesting. So, so maybe to finish it off here, I thought maybe I don't know um, about giving some tips to people, and I think you'll be a good person to give some facilitation tips and coaching tips. Mm. So what would you to somebody uh, that might be listening? Because I think facilitation and coaching those are the type of skills that doesn't matter what your role you're playing, you could mm. benefit or what what your a position as you can benefit from those skills so yeah. maybe let's start with coaching what coaching tips would you give to people um, for me whether it's coaching or facilitation the biggest thing is be open to listening to what people are saying with the whole active listening thing i know everybody goes oh yeah yeah active listening but how often do you practice active listening right and i uh, i i often tell people People hear the word active listening and they understand what it means, but how do you actually practice it? And if so, what is your tip to do active listening? And they go, well, I just listen. I'm like, okay, and as you're listening, what's going on here? And they go, yeah, I'm thinking about stuff. Then you're not actively listening. And so waiting to respond is not the same as listening. So how can you stop waiting to respond? One of the things I do is a technique called voice mirroring. I learned this years ago, and I'm sure it's other people have heard of this too. When people are talking to me and I'm trying to do active listening, what you're saying, I repeat in my head. Mm -hmm. As I repeat your words in my head, limited opportunities for my head to go, oh, I remember the time when that happened to me. Oh, that's so not right. You know, there are limited opportunities for me to go back to my experiences or to form judgments because I'm repeating the words in, in my head. And what that also does is when you stop talking, it allows me to go, okay, he said all of these things. And that allows me to focus on that and then respond. So active listening, what is your technique for active listening? Figure it out, whatever works for you. I have a, a one, of the, one of the coaches that I work with, 
she must have a pencil in her hand and this is what she has to keep doing while while somebody is talking her fingers have to be moving on a pen or she'll keep twirling or doing something because when she's not doing this her mind is thinking oh, other right. things and wandering right mm -hmm. so that's my biggest step figure out what is it that allows you to focus on the person in front of you and their words just to listen not to judge not to respond not, nothing and the other thing people often say is oh yeah active listening and powerful questions i'll ask a bunch of powerful questions yeah but you can't plan those powerful questions ahead of time <laughs> then it's not coaching uh. and it's not facilitation so if you're actively listening when the person stops trust your intuition to say based on what i've just processed in my head what is the question is the right question to ask so active listening trust your intuition to ask the powerful question do not randomly ask any old powerful question because it's a powerful question it doesn't work that way i've seen that often um I mean, I, I used to do that when I first started coaching. I would have a list of powerful questions and rattle off something and then go, that didn't land well. Why didn't it land well? Because it's it was not the appropriate question. And mm -hmm. if you truly listen to the person in front of you and then trust your intuition, the right question will pop in your mind and then ask that. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, and I did the same thing um, uh, as far as, and maybe it's not a bad thing to start with, but I think, you know, once I understood that it's about expanding the space for the person, it's just, it's about yeah. helping them uh, figure things out, understand. And from that perspective, that listening, asking questions, it's listening is key, obviously, but the questions yeah. are contextualized to where yes. the conversation and what they're trying to do rather yes. than just, you know. Yeah. You know, and the questions, the powerful questions that you're asking are, should be asked to create clarity for the person who's talking, not for you. If you never understand what they're saying, it doesn't matter. It only matters that the person in front of you gets clarity. So your questions should help that person get clarity, right? One of the one of the things I'll repeat often is your questions should get the person speaking, explore what's happening and not explain away the things that they've not done. Exactly. Right? How do you that do that? Happen? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just maybe to give example, like I went to that recently where like I was stuck uh, or I'm still stuck. <laughs> I keep telling people and I keep exposing it because I want to get unstuck. I'm writing, finishing my book, but I had a writing coach who had nothing, hasn't read my book doesn't know anything yeah. about what we do and she was trying to help me in a sense coach me through like how do i get unstuck so she was helping me explore like what what's gonna get me back into writing and it was all yeah. me exploring ideas yeah. about you know do i wake up at five what has worked for me what am i gonna you know <laughs> do to exactly. start writing again and it was uh, she was helping me figure out how do i go back yeah in, in, you know into, and yeah. Yeah, and when, so that's a great example, right? Somebody who doesn't know the content is just focusing on helping you figure out how to approach the content. A lot of us, when we do agile coaching, scrum coaching, leadership coaching, we also have some content authority because we've been in the agile space for so long. So self-management is key as well. Because in that right. instance, it's very hard not to go into mentoring. And right? Tell. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, let me tell you what I did. No, no, no. Yeah. So self-awareness that, oh, I'm stepping into mentoring. And then self-managing yourself to go, Is this take the a breath, right thing, step yeah. away. <laughs> and I don't care what book you read. I don't care when you finish your book. My goal is to help you figure out why is it important for you to finish your book? Mm -hmm. What's important about that? and get you there and not go so Milan what's chapter nine all about ah because then we're going to get stuck in content and not move forward then we're going to explain not explore 
Exactly. So, and I think the, the other thing that comes up is like, uh, you know, a lot of times people are looking for mentoring, uh, but we go in as coaches. So like being yeah. clear and explicit about, you, you, yeah. you know, uh, the differences and what you're, what the, uh, you know, person that you're working with is looking for, because you can't coach somebody that doesn't want to be coached. And I think yeah. a lot of times that can backfire if you don't fully understand that. Agreed. Uh, and a lot of times I'll ask people, I, they say, can, can I get you as a coach? I'm like, are you looking for a coach or a mentor? And the normal things I get, what's the difference? I'm like, aha, so you want a mentor? <laughs> <laughs> you think you want a coach that's, all right that's a good one <laughs> uh, let, let me let me explain to you what's the difference and then i asked so now what do you want a coach or a mentor they go just a mentor thank you i'm like oh my oh. then uh, that's a difference yeah. there's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that is and it helps clarify because i don't know if you've been in situations i've been in a situation where i got myself uh kind of not necessarily in trouble but like you know people are questioning the value that you're bringing yep. Yeah. um because they're assuming you're going to mentor rather than coach yeah, um you know that's yeah. again just um so if you're going to do both you have to work with the person in front of you and trust your gut your intuition to say i think you need a little bit of mentoring here can i mentor you and step mm -hmm. into that mentoring uh, stance rather than the coaching stance depending on the person in front of you I often tell my coaching clients, there will be times when I'll step into mentoring and I'll tell you, but I need to sense that they need a little bit more guidance rather than just figuring stuff out for themselves. So you have to figure out what stance you're getting into. And it's not about what you want to do. It has to be the stance you're stepping into to help the person in front of you. And that's a, that's a really good point. Yeah. It's yeah, they're, they're in kind of in the driver's seat and just that awareness too, like that, that you are switching those stances exactly. <laughs> and exactly. doing it intentionally. Yeah. Intentionally switching and mm -hmm. calling it out and saying, I'm doing this so that we can help you. It's not about, let me tell you all the wonderful things I've done in my life. It's, <laughs> exactly. That's doesn't help anyone. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that those are the type of things that, especially uh, uh, those that are, you know, diving into that space of coaching and mentoring, yeah. that they might find help. What is, uh, as we're finishing up here, and it's always, I tell people crazy how an hour flies by. I know, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, is there anything that you would like to leave us with? A message or? You know, uh, as an uh, older student, by older, I mean, somebody I'd worked with years ago, reminded me recently of something I told her, and I've been bringing that back up again. Um, as trainers and coaches, our job is many times, even as a trainer, my job is to get you some knowledge. And my job is to impart knowledge. Your job then is to take that knowledge and make it wisdom, because I don't have your context to make it wisdom for you. I cannot give you wisdom. I can give you knowledge. So the example I told the student and she brought that up to me, I'm like, oh my God, that was such a good example, <laughs> is my job is to give you knowledge. So I can teach you that tomato is a fruit. That's knowledge. Wisdom is you have to figure out that you cannot put tomato in a fruit salad. Mm -hmm. So knowledge is that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is that tomato doesn't belong in a fruit salad. I can give you knowledge. You are the only person who can figure out that wisdom. And contextualize it. Yeah. And contextualize it. So as coaches and trainers, our job is to guide, to provide knowledge, to create a container where you can grow and figure out what that wisdom means to you. Now, you could say, hey, I like tomato in a fruit salad. Somebody else would say, you, tomato and a fruit salad. Again, wisdom is different. It's contextualized. So if you're looking to become a guide or you're coming to one of the guides, remember, we can give you knowledge. We cannot walk the walk for you. We can only get you started. So if you're going to become a guide, remember that as well. Don't tell people what to put in their fruit salad. They got to figure that stuff out for themselves. <laughs>